okay so uh, hello students uh, uh, we will be discussing two important things today uh, management of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, diabetic ketoacidosis we talked about last time we need to discuss today uh, its management and uh, this another uh, you know hyperglycemic crisis in diabetic patients we call it hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state also we'll talk about Okay, so I will discuss, you know, these two topics uh, in the form of case discussions. Okay, so here we have our first case. Uh, he is a 20-year-old male patient who is already a known case of type 1 uh, diabetes. And he presented in the emergency with history of fever, loss of appetite, generalized weakness, excessive thirst, for the past three days and uh, nausea vomiting pain abdomen since one day and altered sensorium uh, since morning right and uh, on examination this patient is uh, dehydrated he's having tachycardia uh, he's having tachypnea and uh, he's running fever also 100 uh, degree Fahrenheit is his fever and his blood pressure is recorded to be low, 80 by 50. Uh, he is drowsy and he is having a fruity smell in his uh, breath. Right? So, uh, what is the tentative diagnosis? Yeah, it is appearing to be clearly a case of diabetic ketoacidosis. Right? So, uh, you have admitted this patient. You have hospitalized him. And his blood sugar uh, was found to be 350 milligrams per deciliter. The plasma ketones were found to be elevated. Urine examination also showed uh, glucosuria as well as ketonuria. And uh, ABG sample, you ask your intern to uh, draw a venous sample only as it is easy to do. And if you recall in the last discussion we found uh, that there is not much difference, you know, between the arterial blood as well as uh, the venous, uh, as well as the venous blood, you know, in terms of pH, hardly 0.15 units, and bicarbonate hardly uh, approximately two milligrams per liter difference. That's all, and that is not going to cause a big difference. And therefore, the the uh, sampling was a venous sampling, and it is justified. And the pH was found to be 7.2, and 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 bicarbonate. Uh, is 12 milligrams per liter. Normal bicarb, we all know, is 22 to 26 millimoles per liter. Uh, his serum potassium was found to be elevated. Normal value for serum potassium is 3.5 to 5. Uh, sodium was found to be low. Normal value here is 135 to 145 millimoles per liter. So uh, TLC was found to be elevated clearly. And uh, blood urea nitrogen is 48, normal value is 10 to 20 only. Creatinine is found to be 1.6, normal in a male patient is 0 0.7 to 1.5. So slightly elevated creatinine, but blood urea nitrogen is, is uh, elevated much more as compared to the rise in creatinine. We'll, we'll speak about this. So the diagnosis is now confirmed and uh, this patient is suffering from diabetic ketoacidosis, no doubt about it. His sugars are uh, more than 250. Uh, the ketone bodies are there in the plasma as well as in the urine and, and the acidosis is there, right? pH is less than, uh, pH is 7.2, which is less than 7.35. Uh, the normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So pH less than 3.5 indicates acidosis. So it is clearly a case of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, right? Now, uh, what next? Hmm? What next? Uh, okay, so uh, this patient requires hospitalization, right? Uh, you need to tell the uh, relatives beforehand that the patient will be requiring hospitalization. It's a critical illness. There's a mortality associated with it. I'll, I'll discuss the mortality and complications later on. Because, you know, of late, uh, there have been a lot of uh, violence in the hospitals with doctors and you know one of the reason behind that yeah the, the, the relatives 
the, the society overall uh, maybe uh, i don't want to comment upon that but um, uh, you know how to prevent this uh, uh, physical uh, or, or the other abuses to towards us is that we need to have a very good dialogue uh, with the patients relative we need to explain everything you know beforehand so you need to explain them that you know the patient requires hospitalization he requires uh, iv fluids iv insulin needs to be continued uh, it is not a matter of few hours it is not that you know his sugar is elevated so we can simply uh, give him insulin shot and uh, he is appearing to be dehydrated blood pressure is a little low so we need to just give uh, fluid say a liter or two uh, you know in a very fast mode and uh, antibiotics we can start iv shot and then later on uh, we can simply discharge the patient in a matter of 3 4 hours uh, no, it is not possible. Uh, I'll explain. This patient requires at least three to four days of hospitalization. And and suppose had our you know patient been totally unconscious, say he's into coma, or or his pH was found to be less than seven, uh, the the bicarb uh, tends to be very very low. Suppose in this situation, you know, we need to even put this patient into ICU, right? So uh, these are really sick patients and, and uh, you know, right from the beginning, we need to take care of uh, this basic uh, ABC. Uh, we need to follow this airway breathing in circulation. So airway needs to be secured. So as the patient is having a history of vomiting, you know, we need to put a nasogastric uh, tube, right? So as to avoid this aspiration. Uh, breathing is spontaneous. In fact, his respiratory rate is high. We all know it is Kusmol's breathing. Uh, last time I, I, I asked you, yeah, it is a rapid and deep kind of breathing, deep. Huh? Uh, so breathing is there, but you know, um, uh, the blood pressure is low. You need to check the oxygen saturation. Uh, at times these patients are into shock and, and therefore the oxygen saturation is less than, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, say 90% and you need to therefore supplement oxygen. And then circulation, yeah, we will take care of. The, the blood pressure is low. So IV fluids uh, will definitely uh, start into these patients, right? Uh, another thing is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we need to uh, put a wide pore cannula. So in fact, two cannulas, one to give the IV fluids. And uh, another is that, you know, we need to withdraw uh, the, the blood samples on a regular basis. So uh, so, uh, you know, the patient should not have, uh, uh, so as not to give pain to the patient, we need to put a separate cannula uh, for, for, you know, taking out the blood samples uh, uh, repeatedly because, you know, we need to maintain a strict uh, sheet, uh, clinical uh, sheet, uh, we call it, uh, while managing these patients. So, what we need to uh, observe here, hourly, you know, we need to monitor the vitals, we need to monitor the urine output, so uh, how much IV fluids we are uh, giving, so input-output charting we need to do. And uh, we need to, uh, you know, monitor his plasma glucose hourly, right? So uh, plasma glucose is a better uh, uh, a reflector of blood glucose rather than, you know, that uh, glucometer-mediated capillary method. So repeated blood sampling, so hourly uh, we want uh, these three. And, uh, you know, four hourly at least, uh, we want to see his uh, electrolytes. Uh, we want to uh, have an observation on the kidney function test also, uh, right? So, uh, arterial blood gases, as I said, for this venous sampling is, is, is sufficient. So, uh, PLC also, we will uh, uh, repeat testing. So, uh, four hourly, you know, these investigations we want. So, we want a separate cannula so that blood can be easily uh, withdrawn from these patients, right? Okay, so the question is then, uh, yeah, so all of the following will be required in his treatment except, so IV fluids, 0.9% uh, normal saline, half normal saline, 5% dextrose, IV regular insulin, IV broad spectrum antibiotics, potassium chloride, so and soda bicarb. All of the following will be required in his treatment, except, mm, well, we will discuss all these fluids are definitely required. Patient is into severe dehydration, his blood pressure is low. Uh, he'll be requiring insulin also, uh, and it has to be a short acting insulin only, no doubt about it. 
and uh, yeah he had fever if you recall normally diabetic ketoacidosis patients don't have fever you know despite infection the reason we discussed that because of the acidosis there is peripheral vasodilatation and and you know uh, as a result of this vasodilatation the the um, uh, skin uh, blood vessels are dilated and the skin is uh, you know uh, losing the uh, dissipating the heat so fever is often not seen but uh, uh, when it is there uh, when, the, when the patient is febrile then clearly infection is there no doubt about it so iv broad spectrum antibiotics have to be started you know uh, till the time the, the uh, urine uh, culture the blood culture or uh, uh, these x rays or ct scan reports uh, we are awaiting right uh, so the, the the confusion is between these three in fact if you recall this patient's serum potassium uh, was how much the serum potassium was found to be elevated and uh, no doubt about it the bicarb was less so you know uh, uh, some of you will think that uh, this should be the answer hmm? kcl no kcl will ultimately be required in his treatment not now but say after two three hours uh, I'll, I'll speak about that uh, the answer to this question is soda bicarb right so this is the statement i mean this is the treatment uh, we do not uh, use in these patients right so i'll explain so let us talk about you know these iv fluids so uh, you know how much uh, iv fluids are required which is the fluid of choice in these patients hmm? now if you recall uh, this patient was found to be dehydrated and uh, his blood pressure was found to be low it was 80 by 50 and uh, his pulse was uh, you know he was having tachycardia right so yeah his pulse was 130 and and uh, his bp was 80 by 50 so uh, how much fluid hmm? how much fluid is required into this patient well uh, see you are asked this question in a in in, in another way also uh, say somebody is having a blood loss right so uh, how to you know judge in the emergency that how much blood loss has happened to this patient hmm? so this is something very very important suppose if a person loses 10 percent of the blood volume uh, or say there is a 10 percent of the blood loss happened to the patient then you know the patient is totally asymptomatic right and and there is nothing to mug up here you you all uh, we, we all have you know uh, donated the blood uh, in our hospitals and uh, you know um, uh, i mean uh, if our weight is above 55 kgs then typically uh, the the uh, blood which is uh, taken out is to the extent of 450 ml right and we have 5 liters of blood total so 10% you know we have donated several times in our blood banks and, and we feel totally uh, asymptomatic and sometimes we wonder you know why these fruity and why these snacks but we enjoy uh, uh, them uh, when uh, you know uh, a 20 percent blood loss happens then uh, again you know at rest uh, there are no findings say this patient presented with emergency and he was lying on the couch so uh, at rest there are no findings at all uh, even you know 20% uh, uh, of the blood loss has happened yeah postural hypotension may be there but as i said at rest there are no manifestations now once the blood loss happens to the extent of 30 to 40% in this range mind you uh, we we have the the uh, tachycardia pulse rate goes up and the blood pressure starts dipping down particularly you know when the losses are towards 40 percent like in this case the, the pulse rate was elevated and blood pressure was found to be low so uh, uh, 40 percent of the uh, blood volume is not there no doubt about it so he's into severe dehydration uh, 40 percent means around two liters uh, of the five liter value so two liters is clearly not there no doubt about it and and if it is 50 percent or more than 50 percent loss then the patient is into full uh, uh, bone shock hmm. so as for the clinical examination only you know we can easily judge that it is a two liter uh, uh, fluid deficit in the uh, uh, intravascular compartment only 
Uh, but then, you know, uh, we, we understand, we, we have discussed diabetic ketoacidosis. This patient has a history of illness for the past three days and he's thirsty and he's having polyuria, he might be having polyuria. And, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the actual fluid loss is to the extent of, say, 100 ml per kg, if you recall. So it is to the extent of, say, uh, in a 60 uh, kg man, it is to the extent of 6 liters. So besides this intravascular volume loss, you know, the interstitial space has already uh, uh, shrunken and, and so is the intracellular compartment. So we need to replenish, uh, you know, the intracellular compartment, the, the interstitial space also besides the intravascular space. And, and not only the 6 liter, in fact, we require much more fluid because, uh, you know, uh, um, as we, we, we talked about that question, bicarbonate is not required, you know. The, the metabolic acidosis gets simply corrected, you know, on the, on, the, on the lines of IV fluids and insulin only. So with these two uh, 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 treatment modalities only, the metabolic acidosis gets corrected on its own. You know how, like once you start giving the IV fluid, so the kidney starts receiving a, a good blood supply now and, and kidney can, can always promote the excretion of these ketone bodies, right? So ketone bodies, they, they start getting flushed off uh, from, the, uh, from the urine. So, you know, uh, while we are managing these patients uh, in the management, suppose after a few hours of your management, if you start finding that the urine ketone levels in fact have gone up, so you need not worry. It is just that the kidneys are washing them off now with your with your IV fluids, right? Similarly, when you give uh, insulin, uh, you know uh, the the uh, peripheral tissues they start utilizing these ketone bodies, right? So uh, ketone bodies are are driven to produce energy production, right? With our insulin uh, treatment. And, and similarly, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, ketosis stops with our insulin treatment. So ketone body production stops and whatever excess ketone bodies we have, uh, they are being utilized in the peripheral tissue in the production of the energy uh, with our insulin treatment. Another thing which happens is with these treatments, you know, if you recall, the, the most abundant ketone body uh, in these patients is, yeah, beta hydroxy uh, butyrate. And this beta hydroxy beta rate, you know, with treatment gets converted into acetoacetate. And if you recall, it is this acetoacetate uh, 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 ketone body which we are detecting, you know, by, by the nitroprusside testing. So, you know, like urinary ketones, the, the serum ketones also uh, start uh, coming up. And again, you need not worry uh, in the sense that this is just, uh, you know, a part of the, uh, uh, this is just a consequence of our treatment modality. Right. So, uh, uh, yeah, coming back to the IV fluid. So what is our strategy? The IV fluid of choice in these patients initially is 0.9% NaCl. So two liters, as we are seeing, the patient is uh, having tachycardia, his blood pressure is low. So two liters we need to give very fast, say in, in one to two hours only. Right. Uh, suppose, you know, if somebody uh, is suffering from uh, some, some uh, cardiac illness, say some left heart uh, disease, uh, you know, these are diabetic patients, they usually have coronary artery disease and, and a recent echo uh, report is there and which is showing a low ejection fraction, you know, as a result of uh, this, this uh, coronary artery disease. Then, you know, you need to place a central venous line also, you know, so as to uh, uh, regulate, you know, the, the uh, IV fluid. So if you are going to give very fast in this situation, then uh, the patient may land up into uh, ARDS, right? So a lot of fluid is going to get collected into the into the pulmonary uh, bed, right? So uh, ARDS may happen to these patients. So you need to be careful, uh, you know, while dealing with these patients. So two liters, uh, you know, we need to give uh, straight away. And then uh, what we do is that, uh, you know, once this two liter we have pushed, now we are going to uh, reduce the, the uh, infusion rate to 250 to, to 500 ml per hour because now we need to replenish the interstitial space uh, uh, losses and the intracellular space losses. Now, but, but just imagine, you know, we, we, we want the, the fluid 
to be driven towards the intracellular compartment, right? What are we want to, to be driven towards the intracellular compartment? So don't you think we, we need to reduce the tonicity of the of the IV fluid? Like 0.9% NaCl has 154 millimoles of sodium and 154 millimoles of chloride. These are simple questions asked to you. Uh, and, and therefore, the total is 308 you know, millimoles per liter. The, the normal plasma osmolality is 285 to 300. So we, we say them it is close to the plasma osmolality. These are isotonic, right? So uh, initial, uh, our, our, our uh, emphasis was on to replenish the uh, IV, uh, uh, I mean, uh, replenish the intravascular compartment. But now, once we have achieved this, so we want to, you know, now uh, uh, replenish the intracellular uh, fluid uh, volume. So for this, we want the water to be moved into the cell and therefore we would like to reduce the tonicity of our IV fluid. So we'll start using now 0.45% NaCl, right, at this rate. So 250 to 500 ml per hour. So I said, why we want to continue with our IV fluid so that the kidney start, uh, you know, uh, flushing off the uh, ketone bodies, right? Okay. Now, uh, so this is uh, this is what the question was. So initially, 0.9% NaCl and then 0.45% NaCl. I'll, I'll speak about 5% dextrose also. So then comes the regular insulin, right? So initial most uh, emphasis is on IV fluids only. The patient is going into shock, right? So once you have stabilized the patient, so now you can start with your insulin. One simple question is asked that, you know, what type of insulin uh, you would like to give to the patient? Hmm? Short acting, intermediate acting or long acting? Obviously, it has to be short acting insulin. So we use either the regular insulin. You can also use the analogs, uh, which, are, which are available nowadays. So you can use SPART, uh, you can use Lispro you can use this glue lysine so all these insulins are short acting ones you can use any of them so we give a bolus 0.1 units per kg uh, iv bolus and then we, we run an infusion you know uh, at the rate of 0.1 units per kg per hour right and we keep monitoring the uh, blood sugar values now, once the blood sugar values, you know, uh, drop down to say between 200 to 250 uh, milligrams per deciliter, so uh, our patient is nil per orally, remember. So, so, so the patient should not go into hypoglycemia. So, what we do is that we add 5% dextrose, you know, along with the 0.45% uh, NaCl. So, this also is a hypotonic solution only. So, uh, the, I mean, we want to hydrate the, the cellular compartment now. So, this will also serve the same purpose. But at the same time, the dextrose in it will not allow, you know, the, the sugar to drop down. So, simultaneously, you know, we, we, uh, once we achieve this target, we, we reduce the insulin infusion to, uh, you know, half, say 0 0.05 uh, units per kg per hour. So why we are, you know, uh, interested in, in, in running the insulin further, despite the fact that we have achieved a near normal uh, uh, sugar? Uh, because, you know, as I said, uh, if you recall the pathogenetic mechanisms, pathophysiological mechanisms, so it was insulin deficiency, you know, which resulted into gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, uh, right? Uh, the glycolysis was inhibited. So with our insulin treatment, the, the new glucose production uh, will be stopped from the liver and uh, the, the patient will start utilizing, you know, this glucose now uh, uh, by the process of glycolysis. Similarly, the ketogenesis, uh, you know, process will also stop uh, uh, with the insulin lipolysis will stop. Hmm. Uh, so, okay, with, with our insulin, say we have, you know, achieved the normal glucose. So, we, we must have achieved all these things also. But what about this huge burden of ketone bodies, which is there into the patient's body? So, uh, you know, um, we are running this insulin continuously so that the peripheral tissues will start using ketone bodies also, uh, so as to produce the energy. And uh, in the meanwhile, these continuous IV fluids will, will allow the ketone bodies, you know, to be flushed off uh, from the system. Right. So you need to continue the insulin.
So till the time the metabolic acidosis resolves, right? Now very important discussion that you know how the metabolic acidosis gets automatically corrected with these two treatment modalities only. I mean why don't we give them bicarbonate, right? So uh, you know the explanation is that uh, you know when the when the kidneys starts receiving a good blood good blood supply as you have corrected the uh, IV uh, I mean intravascular compartment uh, volume. So how the kidney uh, are able to expel uh, you know correct this metabolic acidosis? So as I talked about ketone bodies you know they get filtered down and ultimately they are thrown out uh, into the urine. Ketone bodies I mean to say beta hydroxy butyrate. This gets often converted into acetoacetate. So predominantly acetoacetate, you can say then, in the urine, acetoacetate. Acetone, the other, the third one uh, can be, you know, um, excreted from the lungs only. That is why that fruity smell in these patients. So the kidney is expelling this anion, you know, acetoacetate. Uh, you see, acid. Uh, I mean, if we if we think about chemistry, acid is something you know, uh, an anion which can donate a proton, right? So what I'm speaking about is that kidney is getting rid of this anion through this simple glomerular filtration, right? Now, what about the proton part? What about the proton part? Uh, the kidney pumps these protons, you know, we have two channels in the, in the distal convoluted tubule uh, and, and, and subsequently in the collecting tubule. What are these two channels? One is a sodium potassium hydrogen exchanger. This is the aldosterone dependent channel and another is a potassium hydrogen ATPase, right? So these are the two channels there in the in the distal portion of the tubule. So the kidney pumps these protons into the tubule lumen. Now, uh, you know, I'm going a little offshoot uh, pumping proton into the tubule lumen. Uh, I mean, how ultimately the protons will be expelled into the urine because otherwise protons are very active, they are going to burn uh, the, the tubules, the, the urinary tract. So yeah, the, the question is asked and answer you need to mark is these protons are ultimately you know, removed majorly as ammonium ions, right? So we have this ammonia production going on in the, in the nephronic tubules and if you read biochemistry, you will find that you know, uh, this glutamine uh, amino acid is responsible for this ammonia production and when the ammonia production occurs from glutamine simultaneously there is bicarbonate release also in this process. So you know you, you must have read in your textbooks of medicines that uh, you know the, the kidneys they regenerate bicarbonate. So this is how the kidneys regenerate bicarbonate. So, you know, this metabolic acidosis then is going to get automatically corrected in due course of time. You need to just continue with your IV fluids and with your insulin, right? Okay, so no need to give soda bicarb. Uh, you know, what happens if you give uh, soda bicarb uh, to these patients? Huh? What happens? So, uh, if we are going to give uh, soda bicarb to these patients, then uh, you know there are three issues. One, uh, uh, serum potassium may uh, may uh, you know fall down, so hypokalemia may occur. Huh? So diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, this patient, if you recall, has a has a serum creatinine uh, has a serum potassium of five point. Uh, 5 I guess. Huh? How much was his serum potassium? Let us see this case. His serum potassium was yeah 5.5 5, uh, millimoles per liter. So it was elevated and, and uh, what is the reason? Uh, yes, insulin deficient state, metabolic acidosis state. So if you recall the last discussion, the potassium has come out, right? So if you give uh, bicarbonate now, uh, the reverse will happen, you know, uh, the, the, the potassium was coming out from the cell in metabolic acidosis, so hyperkalemia happened in metabolic acidosis, right? But if you give soda by car, then reverse will happen, so serum potassium will go down, hypokalemia will occur. So one is that there's a risk of hypokalemia. You know, subsequently, I'll, I'll talk about the potassium management uh, 
uh, we have started the insulin also. So insulin also is going to push the potassium towards the intracellular compartment. So serum potassium is going to go low ultimately in this patient. So with our bicar treatment, again, you know, we are going to further uh, lower this uh, serum potassium and hypokalemia is also a risk factor for cardiac arrhythmias. Then uh, second reason is that, uh, you know, metabolic acidosis is there and these patients, they are into shock. Uh, again, in physiology, you must have read this uh, oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So, uh, with the shock occurring and uh, uh, with the metabolic uh, acidosis is there. So, this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, you know, has shifted towards the right. And this is something good uh, uh, that the tissues are, you know, receiving oxygen. But with your bicarbonate treatment, you will be shifting this curve towards the left side. So shifting the curve towards the left side means now there will be difficulty, you know, in releasing the oxygen at the tissue levels. So with your bicarbonate infusion, you will be actually promoting then this tissue anoxia, right? And, and as a result, you know, a very important complication, in fact, you know, some, some, uh, somebody has asked in the comments also, what is the most common complication in diabetic ketoacidosis? The most common complication in these patients is cerebral edema. Right, so cerebral edema can happen to these patients. So uh, one of the reason, very important reason for cerebral edema to happen is when we give bicarbonate to these patients, leftward shift, tissue anoxia, and as a result, uh, damage. Right. So cerebral edema should not happen. For this reason, we do not advise bicarbonate. The the other reasons for cerebral edema in these patients can be uh, like if you are over enthusiastically, you know, giving a very high rate of IV fluids. Uh, that simply it can cause cerebral edema. We saw it can result into ARDS also. It can cause cerebral edema also. Similarly, if you are going to, you know, fastly uh, reduce the, 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 the blood glucose. So if you are going to correct this hyperglycemia in a fast way, then also, you know, it can result into cerebral edema. So cerebral edema uh, is the most common complication, remember, and uh, it is the uh, three underlying causes it has. Uh, if you give bicarbonate, if you are giving an over-enthusiastically high rate of IV fluid, so similar to ARDS, edema can happen. And, uh, you know, the, the bicarbonate, I have explained the reason, tissue anoxia, and blood glucose also, if you are going to lower down uh, in a very fast way, it has been seen that it can, uh, you know, promote cerebral edema. So that is why our insulin infusion, uh, we, we reduced, you know, uh, uh, once the, the sugar was falling down uh, later on. Okay, so bicarbonate is not given. The, the only indication we use bicarbonate in these patients is that when the metabolic acidosis is very, very severe, say less than 6.9 uh, pH, uh, bicarb levels are less than 5. So this usually happens when these patients, they are into full-blown shock, you know. Uh, uh, when the shock happens, so uh, the tissues are not receiving the, the blood supply. And as a result, uh, in addition to the diabetic ketoacidosis, remember, there is lactic acidosis also, right? So this is also a frequently asked question in your vivas. So why lactic acidosis in these patients? This is because circulation is poor. So when these two acidosis conditions are simultaneously operating, you know, at times the, the pH is literally very low and so is the bicarb levels, right? Uh, or if it is a very, uh, you know, dangerous type of, very severe type of hyperkalemia, say, say, uh, potassium levels are, uh, say, 7 uh, millimoles per liter, so very elevated uh, potassium levels, then also you can use bicarbonate. But otherwise, we, we do not use bicarbonate. Uh, for these uh, reasons, right? So answer to that question appropriately was soda bicarb only. Uh, moreover, in the question itself, it was provided that, uh, you know, the pH was uh, uh, just, uh, uh, sorry, this is not the, uh, yeah, moreover, in that question also we saw that uh, uh, the pH was given out to be 7.2. It is way above 7, 6.9 as I'm speaking. Bicarb was also 12, way above that 5 value. And uh, uh, right, so potassium was 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 just 5.5. It is not a very severely elevated uh, um, hyperkalemia. So therefore, uh, you know, bicarbonate is is not uh, used in the treatment, right? And then, uh, yeah, regarding the uh, potassium. So as we are seeing initially in 
this patient serum potassium was 5.5 millimoles milli milli per liter. The reason was insulin was deficient, metabolic acidosis state was there. So potassium, you know, moved out from the intracellular compartment. Though, though we have understood from the last discussion that overall, you know, this uh, total body uh, potassium is is found to be uh, you know deficient in these patients because of the osmotic diuresis phenomenon but you know ultimately with our insulin treatment with the correction of the metabolic acidosis which again i am going to uh, re-emphasize that it is an automatic bicarb regeneration and uh, wash off of ketone bodies from the kidneys so uh, the the uh, uh, potassium now you know starts going down and uh, therefore we, we are monitoring the serum potassium meticulously so we want to maintain the serum potassium strictly in this range 3.5 to 5 the normal value so if it starts dropping down we need to add you know potassium chloride uh, in the in the infusion right no doubt about it you see uh, uh, another viva question here is that at times you know the lab uh, uh, takes time to report the serum potassium value so you need to monitor ecg in that situation and and you should know that hyperkalemia on ecg is is seen as yeah, tall T waves. This is the most common finding with hyperkalemia on ECG. And whereas hypokalemia, you know, the, the T waves, they uh, become flat. There are additionally U waves also we start seeing on ECG. So based on the ECG also, we can adjust, uh, I mean, we can decide uh, the, the KCL is required at this time or not. Okay. So potassium is also very, very important in the management. Uh, there are other electrolytes also, you know, uh, which are into deficit, say phosphate, say magnesium and others, but usually their supplementation is not required because you know, ultimately in three days time, this acidosis will automatically get corrected. Uh, the, the fluid deficit we are going to uh, uh, control and ultimately this patient will start eating uh, and, and then uh, these common electrolytes will be replenished through the diet, right? Then uh, IV antibiotics was one of the options. So yeah, we have to start at broad spectrum. So as I said, uh, fever is usually not there, but if it is there, a sure short indication uh, of infection. So you need to start the IV antibiotics, no doubt about it, right? So uh, what else in the management? Yeah, so uh, lastly, you know, uh, uh, we want uh, the, the prevention of these episodes of you know diabetic ketoacidosis uh, before prevention before prevention one more thing in the management like say uh, you know in three days time you have you have corrected the fluid deficit and uh, you have corrected uh, the the uh, metabolic acidosis also i mean you have not corrected what you, uh, the kidneys itself have corrected uh, the insulin, yeah, with your insulin treatment, you have promoted the ketone body utilization. So you have partially also corrected metabolic acidosis. So the patient is now out of his illness and, uh, you know, he is fully conscious, oriented. He's, uh, he has regained his uh, appetite. So he's demanding food now. And, and moreover, we also have to plan his discharge, right? So uh, once we are, you know, going to plan the discharge, so we have allowed the patient to eat, uh, you know, orally. And um, uh, so therefore, now we need to switch uh, the, the insulin from IV to subcutaneous, obviously. Uh, I mean, the patient himself can administer uh, insulin. These, these patients are type 1 diabetic patients, uh, so they, they know how to administer this. Uh, but, you know, uh, just an important thing in the management that, uh, uh, say, uh, you are going to stop the IV insulin infusion, you know, two hours after you have given the uh, subcutaneous dose, not before that. Why? Because, you know, IV insulin has a very short half-life. It is merely, uh, say, 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 around three minutes, not more than that. Whereas, uh, when, once you give a subcutaneous injection, you know, it takes time for the insulin levels to build up. So, if you will not do this, huh, say, uh, as I said, you need to stop your IV insulin infusion only after two hours after giving uh, subcutaneous insulin. So, if you are not going to do this, your patient will go into, uh, again, into ketoacidosis. So, we, we call this complication as rebound ketoacidosis.
right rebound ketoacidosis so these are the few complications you know we are encountering in these patients as i said most common uh, to happen is this cerebral edema uh, and and typically you know the cerebral edema uh, happens to uh, children only uh, uh, largely uh, and and how we identify the cerebral edema to happen this this most common complication like initially once you have started iv fluids insulin so your patient you know uh, the mental status will improve uh, the child has become conscious but uh, you know after some time the child will again uh, be be going into drowsiness or stupor uh, or, or or frankly comatose you, like, you will you will you will be suspecting this cerebral edema to 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 happen you know so uh, uh, the the reason for cerebral edema to to uh, occur is as i said over enthusiastic iv fluids will be causing cerebral edema uh, a fast correction of uh, hyperglycemia so over enthusiastic insulin or uh, if you are inadvertently using this soda by car then you are going to push this patient for cerebral edema and if at all a patient goes into cerebral edema so you have to give many tol then you know you you need to prop up the patient now then next complication uh, we talked about was ARDS so again this is uh, a situation with over enthusiastic iv fluid uh, rate and and lastly this rebound ketoacidosis right so these are the three important complications with diabetic ketoacidosis patients so this should not happen as i said you need to ensure that uh, the iv insulin needs to be continued for at least 2 hours after the subcutaneous insulin injection at the time of discharge of the patient right uh, okay and and then last thing in the management of diabetic ketoacidosis is uh, its prevention right so uh, how to prevent further episodes so we need to you know uh, teach this type 1 diabetic patient uh, say in the history type 1 diabetic patient is not there it is type 2 but on insulin so it is i mean this is the other subset if you recall that the discussion we talked about the dk largely happens to type 1 diabetic patient only but it may happen to a type 2 diabetic patient also who is you know now having total insulin deficiency and is on insulin only to 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 manage his uh, glucose levels so you need to you know teach these patients that see whenever some infection happens so um, uh, uh, you know the insulin requirement goes up because of the infection stress the the counter regulatory hormones are also going up so therefore the insulin requirement also goes up yeah you are right that uh, you know the 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 loss of appetite is there so there is a risk of hypoglycemia also so you know you need to uh, uh, increase your uh, monitoring of this uh, blood glucose self monitoring of blood glucose one and and secondly uh, Uh, so don't reduce the dose of uh, insulin uh, uh, i mean um, uh, you check your blood glucose and as per that only uh, you you uh, you know take the insulin and often you need to uh, actually increase the dose of insulin as i have explained and and secondly uh, you know you need to increase your fluid intake right so kidneys are going to wash off uh, these uh, ketone bodies right and uh, yeah with with regard to your febrileness you know uh, whenever it happens so you need to promptly uh, you know uh, attend the uh, opd and uh, the, the oral antibiotics will work uh, initially you know and and these infections will get uh, into control so these are the sick days you need to explain to these patients right uh, i mean uh, they should not uh, delay their uh, you know uh, and they should seek the medical attention as soon as possible so if you are going to delay the um, uh, uh, you know uh, seeing 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 the uh, doctor then uh, you may land up into this complication as as you are into now uh, even admit few days back so this is how you can prevent uh, this diabetic ketoacidosis uh, into these patients right now uh, uh, that's all uh, so let us talk about this other case uh, you know of today's discussion okay so we have another case now so here we have a 60 year old male who is a known case of type 2 diabetes mellitus okay and he is on ohs right he is on ohs so previous patient uh, if you recall was on insulin only diabetic patient uh, 
So he's on OHS and he's a known case of chronic kidney disease and, and uh, he's having coronary artery disease also and therefore he's on Nicosprin and Torvastatin also in the emergency and here we have a history of fever for the past two weeks loss of appetite, generalized weakness, excessive thirst, excessive urination for the past 10 days and he stopped the OHAs you know on his own two weeks back we having hypoglycemia so this is the thing these patients do we need to advise them that during sick days in fact you know the requirement goes up so uh, then he developed lethargy increasing lethargy and increasing drowsiness you know, for the past three days and now he's into uh, you know unconscious state uh, since morning right so uh, on the history there is no history of nausea vomiting and pain abdomen right and on examination this patient is into severe dehydration he is stuporous so he is arousable uh, he is not into full blown coma so we, we say it is a stuporous state so again fever is there respiratory rate is is normal you can see right uh, the tachycardia is there the blood pressure so uh, this patient is into uh, you know uh, dehydration uh, there is loss of circulatory volume no doubt about it but characteristically the respiratory rate is normal there is no history of nausea vomiting pain abdomen so ketosis is not there right metabolic acidosis clinical features are, are, are not there and uh, considering the history you know uh, this patient is appearing to be in hyper glycemic hyper osmolar state so though we need to confirm it there can be other causes to, to to unconsciousness but then you know going by the history it is appearing to be uh, hyper glycemic hyper osmolar state only now what is the difference we are getting in this uh, in this case scenario as against diabetic ketoacidosis uh, one uh, this is you know a type 2 diabetic patient uh, who is on oral hypoglycemic agents uh, second is that it is, you know, sort of subacute illness. So as we can see, uh, there is a two-week history in this patient with a risk diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, which precipitates in a matter of one or two or maximum three days. So there we have few days kind of history, acute presentation. Whereas in hyperglycemic, uh, hyperosmolar state, we have a subacute kind of presentation as we are seeing in this patient. And third thing uh, you need to know is that, you know, this HHS is far less common uh, uh, in clinical practice, you know, as compared to uh, the, the diabetic ketoacidosis, right? Okay. Then, uh, so again, you know, you have hospitalized this patient and, and random blood sugar is found to be 800 milligrams per deciliter. Right. So sugar value is very, very elevated. And this is the fourth difference, you know, between DK and HHS that here the sugar values, you know, tend to be very, very high. So in diabetic ketoacidosis, whereas the sugar values tend to be between 250 to 600, here, uh, you know, in HHS, we find the sugar values to be between 600 to 1200 milligrams per deciliter. Right. And as a result of these very high sugar values in these patients, the, the serum osmolality, you know, tends to be very much elevated. So that is why the name hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state. And basically this high serum osmolality is causing the CNS manifestations in these patients and coma uh, is, 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 is quite common in, in hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state. Now, uh, the kidney function is uh, deranged here, right? Uh, there, you know, in DK, I, I forgot to mention, if you recall, the values of BUN was, uh, I think, 40 only in that case. Normal value of BUN is 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, the creatinine in that uh, patient was 1.6 um, milligram per deciliter, and here it is 3 milligrams per deciliter. In the question itself, they have... Uh, given you that he is already a known case of CKD and if you recall my previous discussion we discussed that uh, you know the, the best OHA is to be used in this patient I mean I, I he should also have been insulin only but 
uh, he might have refused insulin. So the best OH is we can use is this short-acting sulfonylurea. And if you recall, this DPP-4 inhibitor is another safe class and particularly prefer linagliptin, linagliptin, which does not require any dose modification. So this patient is into CKD and that is why, you know, bucreatinine and bone is elevated. Now, as compared to this patient vis-a-vis -vis the previous diabetic patient, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis patient, where the, the values were given to be, uh, urea was the same, 40, but creatinine was only 1.6. Uh, why this difference? You know, in this question I asked you, uh, in, in my previous discussion, somebody answered uh, uh, also, I, I saw that comment that because of the fluid loss, uh, yeah, uh, good, you are, you are uh, right, but then, you know, you need to elaborate it a little further. Uh, basically, you know, uh, in, in diabetic ketoacidosis, the thing is that the patients are into pre-renal uh, kind of insert. And, and since kidneys are receiving less blood supply, you know, the kidneys, they are uh, preferentially reabsorbing urea also, right? So kidneys are meant to eliminate urea. Hmm? Kidneys are meant to eliminate creatinine. Now, creat creatinine cannot be reclaimed from, from the tubules, but urea can be reclaimed from the tubules. And, and you know, in these situations, when the uh, intravascular fluid volume is, is low, the kidneys, they start preferentially reabsorbing the urea back into the circulation because the, the urea contributes to serum osmolality. You know this formula, huh? 2 into sodium concentration plus glucose divided by 18 plus bone divided by 2.8. So, uh, 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 a rising blood urea, you know, will be maintaining the intravascular volume. So, you can remember this way that yeah, the patient is into pre-renal. The kidney is receiving less blood supply. And, and therefore, you know, uh, the kidney uh, is, is having a reduced ability to eliminate blood urea nitrogen and creatinine. So both are rising. But since kidney additionally, simultaneously is reclaiming urea also, so as to maintain the, the uh, vascular volume, therefore the rise in BUN is much more, you know. Uh, uh, this this normal ratio uh, between bone and creatinine, so normal bone is 10 to 20, the creatinine normal is 0 0.7 to 1.5. So this normal ratio is 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 roughly uh, you know between 10 to 20 only. But in in the in the pre-renal state of diabetic ketoacidosis, this ratio often becomes more than 20 to 1. So this is very frequently asked question. Whereas in sharp contrast to this, these hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state patients, you know they are already uh, chronic kidney disease patients, so, so kidneys are not working well in these patients. So therefore, both the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine, they are being retained in, in uh, you know, equal proportion. And that is why their, their ratio is well maintained here. So bone is 40, it has doubled, say, and so is creatinine, right? So their normal 10 to 20 is to 1 ratio is maintained. Uh, in these patients and and you know this is another reason for the sugar to be very high in these patients because if you recall we have this safety valve mechanism uh, uh, operating in the kidney so once the sugar goes above 180 in the blood so its rate of filtration you know is more than the rate of reclamation from the proximal tubule and and thereby the kidneys eliminate the, 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 the glucose but uh, since the safety valve has gone down so the, the sugar has gone up drastically right uh, another difference we can find is serum potassium is found to be normal though uh, the total body potassium uh, uh, loss is there no doubt about it because of this osmotic diuresis phenomenon in this patient whatever uh, though the kidneys are not working that way uh, why because uh, you know the the metabolic acidosis is not there so that is why the serum potassium is is normal uh, serum sodium is low. There also it was low and we, we understand, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I uh, use this word pseudo-hyponatremia in the previous discussion. Actually, the, the right word to describe this uh, low serum sodium in both these patients is dilutional. Pseudo-hyponatremia is a little different term. Uh, here you should use a term, yeah, so I want to correct myself. Here you, you, you need to use this term dilutional. So as the sugar values are high in the plasma, so, you know, uh, the, the water comes out uh, by the process of osmosis and thereby it leads to dilution of the serum sodium. So, serum sodium is, is low, uh, that is why. And ABG has been done rightly, a venous sample has been taken. 
so it is almost normal pH 7.34 bicarbonate is slightly low uh, why probably you know because of this lactic acidosis you know the BP is low so but it is not uh, as per the definition of diabetic ketoacidosis if you recall bicarbonate typically below 15 pH is less than 7.3 so it is almost preserved pH so little bit slightly lower side uh, due to the lactic acidosis right so then uh, the the question uh, is the same you know all of the following in the treatment except so yeah the answer is clearly uh, soda bicarb here because uh, here as i said acidosis is not there there may be little acidosis because of lactic acidosis but for slight acidosis we do not use soda bicarb for the reasons we've already done so uh, what are the differences you know uh, as far as the treatment is concerned so here we prefer 0.45 percent nscl you know because the the uh, plasma osmolality is also is is already very very high so why not use a hypotonic solution to begin with and um, insulin uh, again the same short acting ones we use but then uh, in in uh, in lesser doses you know uh, because these are not uh, insulin deficient patients huh? they have a relative deficiency of insulin so we'll be using lesser dose of uh, insulin uh, fluids one 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 more thing you need to know that you know here the uh, condition being subacute huh? this patient had a two weeks history so fluid deficit is much more as compared to diabetic ketoacidosis so there it was six liters we talked about here you know it is double say 10 to 12 liters fluid deficit so uh, the, the IV fluids, they, they need to be run for a prolonged period in these patients. So uh, these patients are uh, more sick and therefore they require uh, more, uh, you know, hospitalization duration. Then IV antibiotics, yes, the patient was febrile also. And uh, potassium also, you know, uh, is, is required once we have started giving them insulin. Right, so potassium starts moving into the cell, and hypokalemia may be observed. But uh, here we need to be more meticulous with our serum potassium measurements because the, the, the kidney is not working, and uh, once the kidneys are not working, so hyperkalemia, uh, you know, has a tendency to to happen. So you need to meticulously observe the serum potassium. So if it starts falling, then you can give potassium also, uh, but again in a reduced dose because the patient is already suffering from chronic kidney disease. So answer is clearly uh, soda bicarb only, right? So, uh, you know, another difference, uh, so what all differences we have done between uh, DKA and HHS? As I said, uh, this happens to uh, typically type 1 diabetic patients, so these are young patients. This happens to type 2 diabetic patients who are elderly, who have uh, insulin already in their body, you know, uh, and, and that is the explanation that uh, insulin is not totally deficient, that the insulin levels are there in the body and that is why, you know, the ketogenesis is not there, right? So, insulin, uh, just remember this way, that insulin is deficient, no doubt about it. That is why, you know, the gluconeogenesis, the glycogenolysis uh, processes are going on and, and as a result, the sugar values are rising but some insulin levels are there to prevent the ketogenic state, right? So ketogenesis is keto ketosis, metabolic acidosis, uh, ketoacidosis particularly is not there, though lactic acidosis may be there as, as we have discussed. So here we have uh, the uh, metabolic acidosis due to uh, ketone bodies. Then uh, this is common to happen, this is uncommon, right? Then, uh, as I said, fluid deficit here is around 6 liters. Here it is around 10 to 12 liters. So, very severe uh, fluid loss. Serum potassium tends to be elevated at presentation. Here, serum potassium is often normal. Uh, reason we have already done metabolic acidosis is not there. And uh, then, you know, uh, the, the uh, fluid of choice is, say, 0.9% NaCl. Here, we, we, we want to use 0.45 person to, to start with because it is already a very hyperosmolal state and and uh, the duration you know of IV fluids is also tends to be prolonged because the fluid deficit is much more right uh, and and lastly you know uh, complications if you recall there we discussed this cerebral edema as the most common uh, complication in these patients uh, here uh, typically we don't find cerebral edema uh, here, you know, the, the, this complication of 
uh, deep vein thrombosis because these patients they require prolonged hospitalization and, and these are already coronary artery disease patients so uh, myocardial infarction can happen to them so we need to prophylactically you know put these patients on low molecular weight heparin so that is the most common complication uh, here uh, right uh, mortality uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis is less uh, in good centers it is less than 1% right uh, whereas here these patients are elderly uh, they are already uh, you know known cases of ckd as well as coronary artery disease so mortality is 10 times more uh, than the uh, diabetic ketoacidosis right so uh, that's all for today hmm? so uh, again you know the same advice go through any of your textbook of medicine right so reading uh, medicine from any of the textbook is going to be help to you not only towards clearing postgraduate medical entrance exams but also later into your clinical practice. Uh, so you can read any of them, uh, be it Davidson's or CMDT or Cecil's or Harrison's. Huh? But for ENT, remember ENT for entrance exams only. So that is a one-stop book I'm recommending. Okay. So thank you.